HIV changes everything in your life. Absolutely everything. It, f from everything, from the way you eat, to the way you sleep, to everything. It's, it's like dealing with um, uh, a, li an, a limb that's missing. It truly impacts your life from a cellular level on out. Um, it's always there. There's always compensation that you have to make in your life. Uh, for me, the, the thing has been to uh, learn to carry my burden with grace, right? And um, it's in me, I have the virus, uh, but it isn't me. You got to be really careful on how you interpret things about HIV and you know for every you know story that I say one thing I mean there's going to be people who have stories saying another thing or you know each person is so you know individual and um, and 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 their their unique constellation of dynamics economics social family all that kind of relational all that stuff really um, you know really makes them a unique constellation If a person's going to be part of my life, I say, yeah, you know, this is what I have. Um, and I educate them about it, and it doesn't change their friendship. Where before, if I kind of hear them, uh, I try to disclose it. Oh, no, you're not. Well, yeah, I am. And, uh, but you don't look like you're sick. Um, I'm not sick. You know, then all of a sudden, they put these flags up, then they stop. Uh, contact me, don't uh, invite me to the parties no more, or over the place for dinner. And so now I'm very careful on who I disclose to. My father was stunned. He says, well, it's going to be okay, son. I said, no, it's not. And I looked him in the eye like I'm looking you in the eye. And he said, I spoke with my doctor. He said, longest I have is probably 15 years tops. As it stands right now, they have nothing to stop or slow it down. That's the reality. And then he didn't say anything after that, because that was a fax in 94. They didn't have what they have now for drugs. My mother, she didn't say nothing. And, and my family never brings it up unless I bring it up. Oh, jeez. That was hard. Um, I told him within a few days, I really didn't know how I was going to tell them, but I knew I had to tell them. <laughs> so um, the first people I disclosed to was my sister and my mom. <laughs> and uh, they took it really bad. They took it really hard. And uh, of course they cried. <laughs> but um, I told them I was going to be okay. And um, he told me, and he said, and I just want you to know that you'll, I'm sure you'll be dead in less than two years. Um, he was just, this is what you have, you'll be dead in less than two years. And I said, oh, okay, I wasn't expecting that. And uh, I have a strong will to live. I don't know much about the virus, as many people don't. Um, but I guarantee you I'll still be here in 10 years. And uh, we left it at that. And he recommended as he walked me out, because everyone else had left the office, he said, I really think you should see a psychiatrist because I really don't think you understand how serious this is. And uh, I said to him, I, I respect where you're coming from, but you know what? I'm one of those people I deal with things face on. I understand the seriousness of it, but I'm not one of those people that's just going to give in. And I think you, you live and you deal with whatever comes along. And it's been 24 years.
I think, you know, it used to be that the AIDS Committee of Windsor, you know, back way back in the 90s or whatever, we get a lot of phone calls about, you know, can I get it from a doorknob, right? And we don't get those questions as much anymore. But we do get, you know, can I get it from, uh, well, the mosquito question's never asked. I bring it up and people don't know, right? And I think people think they know more about HIV uh, than they really do. I think they overestimate the amount they know. But for example, we would get, you know, uh, I smoked a cigarette, I shared a cigarette with somebody. Uh, could I get HIV that way? Well, what about if it was in the winter and you know how sometimes your lip sticks to it and if you pulled off and then, you know, gave, they gave you the cigarette and then you did the same thing, is it possible, you know? You, get, you do get some of those questions, but the phone isn't ringing off the hook like it used to. Hmm. I would say one, I don't know if this is the biggest, but I would have to say um, I find that people will often say that if someone is positive, they assume that they're automatically extremely promiscuous. Um, and personally, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, and fortunately for me, I like to debate, I like to have good conversation with people, and I don't mind challenging people. And I would say if someone you met told you they were pregnant, and sometimes that happens, are you going to automatically assume they slept with half the city? We know that's not necessarily true. It just takes one time and the person could have been in a monogamous relationship been dating someone for three years and become pregnant. It could have been their first time they were sexually active. These types of things can happen in um, gay relationships as well. Um, and people often assume if someone's positive that they are gay and they don't necessarily have to be. They can be heterosexual. Um, and again, it goes back to behaviors, either you're practicing safe sex or not. So. Probably the two, the two biggest myths I would say would be assuming that they're extremely promiscuous and or um, assuming that they're gay. Well, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there that, uh, you know, they're not, people are not educated about it. So they think they can get it by kissing, sharing utensils, uh, drink it from somebody's glass. Uh, they just, they're not educated, so there's a lot of myths out there about how they can get infected. You know, I believe that if I hung around with somebody who was positive, I would get it. I also believe that um, if I shared a drink, I would get it. Um, I believe that there was some, um, if I slept in the same bed with somebody, I would get it. And I always, before I got it, I believe that if I touched somebody who had it, I was going to get it. And. Uh, well, that ain't even true. As far as I'm concerned, the biggest myth is the one that the drug companies and the medical establishment portray right now is that HIV is a chronically manageable disease, just like uh, just less like uh, diabetes. So if you want to go and talk to the guy who's in a wheelchair who's just had both legs amputated because of his diabetes, ask him how chronically manageable he thinks his disease is. A person dies of AIDS in this country, in Canada, every 1.75 days. So people are still dying for this disease. People still get incredibly, incredibly ill, have opportunistic infections and die every day. So ask one of those people or their family how chronically manageable they think HIV is. What a load of crap. The biggest myth about HIV and AIDS now is that you can just take a pill and everything will be fine. In fact, they call the pills cocktails. And let me tell you, it's not like any cocktail I've ever had. I think people can be a little bit more, um, oh yeah, well, we know all about that. I mean, we know how it's contracted. So it's, it's almost dismissed. Um, and I think in doing that, once again, by dismissing how the disease was contracted, we're dismissing what that person went through when they got their diagnosis. So I think the dismissive behavior is also harmful.
we have to be careful how we label people, you know, because that's the that's the very essence of stigma, right? Is 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 the labeling of a person, right? The stigma meaning the mark, right? We have marked the person. I've seen I've seen and again it's usually in these group situations where I've seen like, you know, a person who is talking to someone who's uh, I know is HIV positive or a couple of other people do and then someone will sort of take it upon themselves to go over to the to the person who's being talked to and say, well, you know that person's HIV positive. You know, um, you know that's not the that's it's otherizing and it's it's weird. I can tell you a story when I was in Michigan. It's this, uh, there's, there's a lot of bigotry and uh, still uh, closed mindedness over there. And it was something that there was no pride like when it comes to being positive there. I used to hear sick jokes at work about AIDS and HIV. And I couldn't speak up because I didn't want to lose my job. But I'd say to one guy, well, what have ever happened to your sister? Oh, when my sister, she's not a junkie and she ain't sleeping at all. But, you know, it doesn't take that, but one time. One one time and you can get it. One time, one protected sex. But they got that stigma. They're, they're a tramp, you know what I'm saying? They're a prostitute or they're a junkie. It wouldn't happen. I says, yeah, okay. I couldn't speak up because I would lose my job. You would say, well, I'm HIV positive, and I'm not gay, I'm not a junkie. I got it because I'm protected sex, you know? And uh, it's just, it's still, in Michigan, it's a dirty, dark, bad thing to have or disclose of it. And in certain jobs, you'll lose your job because of it. That's the real sad thing. Um, for me, uh, as a, you know, two-spirited, Métis gay man in an interrelation, uh, interracial relationship, um, I face stigma on all levels. Uh, uh, probably since the day I was born, because in our dominant culture, everyone's assumed heterosexual. And uh, so when you know you're different, uh, it's, it shows up every day, all the time. Sometimes in meeting people for the first time who are new to the field, sometimes you still get, oh. And so absolutely, that is a recognition that all of a sudden they view me differently as either a victim of the disease or as a person who is lesser than. And they're compensating by giving me face that would indicate that they're being supportive, but what they're doing is actually stigmatizing me, and uh, I'm realizing that uh, they are they in you know uh, internalizing stigma. Has led to me being stigmatized. Whew. I was hospitalized in the 90s. I had to have my gallbladder out and I had a nurse who was near retirement who would not come in my room. She would come to the door. She would stand in the doorway or creep inside. Um, and I actually had to lodge a complaint about her um, because she was really of the firm belief. Now, mind you, we're in the 2000s now, but this was about 96, 97, um, that she was going to get it by walking in the room. Employment. It's like, uh, can't disclose it at work. I could, I could have lost my job because of it. And, uh, because I was working at there as a processor. And they even had the, uh, I forget what they call them, where they have these people at these plants. Oh, he worked in sanitary. He was the head sanitary guy there. He made sure everything got cleaned properly and stuff, and, uh, had his own office and stuff. He comes out there and makes an announcement to the plant, and they had a meeting. A bunch of people came up to the office. This was in Michigan. He says, anybody that has uh, hep C can't work in the processing area or the filler room, in the filler room and, or, and or HIV. Well, I had it, so I had to keep it a secret. I was working for a home cleaning business, and I had disclosed my status to one of my coworkers. 
and I believe she told my boss and within a few days I was fired. Wow. It was sad because uh, when I disclosed to a couple of co-workers that I was, that I thought I trusted, um, and then they end up telling somebody else and they told somebody else and then I was asked to leave the job because of, um, they couldn't afford my, if I got sick, my health benefits. It was interesting to uh, be able to uh, work in the area for a while. Uh, incredibly frustrating uh, because, you know, uh, you, you, you can't you can't police people's sexual encounters. <laughs> can't you know? You can give them again. You can give them the the knowledge, right? Hope that it's going to change an attitude. Hope that it's going to translate into behavior. But uh, you know, it's not always going to. And uh, so. I, I really am, uh, you know, a proponent of trying to reduce harm as much as possible because I, you know, nothing's ever going to be perfect, and and I think that the more we kind of triangulate efforts and research and 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 social activism uh, of all sorts of different types, uh, all at the same time, I think we're going to be able to uh, at least make things better, and and I hope not worse. Uh, well, uh, my last doctor's appointment, my doctor told me that I would die of old age, not from HIV. So the medicine can take care of the, vi the viral uh, implications, but uh, there isn't any medicine to take care of the emotional toxicity that comes from being stigmatized. Um, I think for me, while I'm fairly open about my status, um, I'm also very selective in who I discuss it with. Um, I and into how much detail that I would go into. Um, but one of the things I always preface it with is I'm not, you know, I'm someone who's living with HIV. I'm not a victim of HIV, um, and that I'm not looking for sympathy or for anyone to feel sorry for me. I often say to people, everybody has a cross to bear, regardless of whether it's cancer or heart disease or, you know, uh, sugar diabetes or MS or you know whatever. Um, and we all deal with it differently. Um, so for me. I can't imagine, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I can't imagine life uh, to be any different. It's become, it's just a part of me. I'm a complex, diverse individual, and it's just one of the components that makes me who I am. So 